What's going on everybody? Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and whatever time it is, welcome back to yet another video with you man, Immersion Holic, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another faction overview for the 1.3.2 patch for the divided to para overhorn one for total war Rome 2. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are checking out Macedon. That's right, we are revisiting Macedon. Uh, I have covered it in the past, so feel free to go check out the old faction overview if you want to see a comparison on what's changed. Uh, but there has been some pretty major changes, specifically on the campaign map, um, but their roster has also see received some pretty significant changes as well. Um, but anyway, everybody, without me c continuing on anymore, let's go ahead and jump into the cultural buffs and debuffs of Mastodon, and then we'll jump into the part one section of this video timestamps will be in the description as always. So first off, Macedon is part of the Diadokoi cultural group, which uh, encompasses Macedon, the Seleucids, Bactria, Epirus, and the Ptolemies, aka Egypt. You share uh, all of the following two buffs, uh, with all of these factions, sorry. Uh, you have the Alexander's Legacy buff, which has a minus 20% resistance to foreign occupation, very very nice. And then you have the Successor Conflict buff, which gives you plus 10% morale for all units during battles against Hellenic factions. Pretty helpful, but... I mean, all of these factions get these, and you'll be fighting all of them, to be honest, especially Epirus. Uh, the Seleucids probably, Egypt for sure, and then Bactria probably in the late game. So they'll all have the same buff against you, so keep that in mind. So moving on to the Macedonian specific buffs and debuffs, we have the Barbarian Subduers buff, which increases morale against Barbarians, then you have the Commercial Leases buff, which increases industrial income. We then also have the Hellenic Rivalry debuff, which does a minor diplomatic penalty with all Hellenic factions, which you won't really notice too much until you're playing on harder difficulties, like hard or hardest, I mean not hardest, uh, very hard. Um, where diplomacy will be even harder than normal. So it can be a little tricky, but it's not a massive debuff, and you'll be fighting most of the Hellenic factions anyway, because they are in your way of recreating, of course, the Alexander Macedonian Empire, which is what everyone wants to do when you play Macedon, right? Why not? Um, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump into the part one section of this video, where we'll check out the campaign for Macedon. Alright everyone, here we are checking out Macedon on the Grand Campaign map, of course. You can place Macedon in several other DLCs. This faction overview can be reflective of that, and that we'll talk about their rosters, which you can play in all of the uh, campaigns. However, the campaign situation is just for the Grand Campaign. You are, of course, a one-hitter quitter. Macedon has fallen on very hard times since the death of Alexander, and as such, you are now barely the hegemon of Greece. Um, you start off with just Pella. You have a single army led by your Basileus. Uh, he has a sacred squadron general, Thessalian cavalry, Greek bronze shield pikemen, and a crappy slinger. <laughs> um, your situation uh, with Republic Order also is very bad. Uh, note that, minus 20 on turn 1. Whoa! That is very, very high. Um, you can, you know, get out of it relatively easily, but just be aware you don't want to leave your army in there and you want to, you know, start taking measures to account for that quite quickly. Pella is, of course, the capital city of the Macedonia province here. Pella, Apollonia, and Larissa. Uh, both of which do have resources. You got olives right here and then wine over here. Not too crazy, but they do help you out. Um, to your north, you got some silver. Then to your west, you got copper. Uh, and then, of course, over northeast, you got slaves. And then uh, marble down in Sparta. So you do have the potential for some resources to get involved. Um, so that's going to be uh, something that you'll get as you progress throughout the campaign. But anyway, you have a very small like starting province of just Macedonia. Um, but let's get into your political situation and we'll talk more about that. You have a single war going on against these Celts to your northeast, the Tolisto Bogiai. They'd like to get down and boggy boggy to it. Um, I believe this is a faction of Celts that has migrated in from 
uh, the northwest, and they've come down here, and their cousins, the Galatians, have broken off and moved on to Galatia, but these bad boys are still here on your northeastern border, and they are still a menace. So you are absolutely going to be at war with them. Uh, they have the city of Polpadeva, and that's it, but it is the capital of Thrace, so that's like a good way to kind of get some headway into the province at least. Uh, by taking the capital and then, you know, going here, there, everywhere, wherever you like. Um, but just be aware, it isn't another province, so you, you're not going to have a lot of Hellenic culture over here. And in fact, all of these cities in here are owned by non-Hellenic factions. So actually holding on to Popadeva will be a bit of a pain in the butt, and you're probably going to have to do a lot of focusing on public order and cultural conversion. Uh, and then speaking of further... Uh, nothing further diplomacy um you have your client state which is athens that's right athens is actually a client of yours now you don't even have trade with them be welcome the only uh the treaty you have strikers. is the client state status so they don't really like you all that much but if you are playing on normal difficulty it welcome. is possible to do things I like get trade open. with them and stuff you might have to throw them a little bit of money just because you know you are forcing them to be your client state they're not gonna like you for it but it is a potential thing if you want to be a little bit more friendly with Athens and as a result Sparta because Sparta and Athens are actually really close they're very buddy buddy at the beginning of uh, the Grand Campaign typically they used to ally against uh, you uh, Athens and Sparta would often lead the way against Macedon back in the old days before the 1.3 era of patches came in and overhauled diplomacy for all of the factions now, they can definitely still get mad at you and declare war, but you can buy them out a lot easier. Get that trade going with Athens quickly. Get some non-aggression with Sparta if you can. Maybe pay them a fair bit of money. If you want to. You might just prefer to go ahead and take their territory. Because look at Athens earning 3,500... Uh, whatever you want to call it. Coins, gold, income, whatever. Uh, on turn one. That is substantial. That is not bad at all. Granted, a lot of... Actually, no, not a lot of it comes from trade. But they do have a lot of resources that comes from trade with Egypt. Um, so, definitely try to get yourself some trade going because you do have a port as your capital. Uh, so you can definitely send out like a ship out here into Western Mediterranean and then one out to the Black Sea as well. If you really want to abuse trade, which you probably will on the early game. If your economy is not in a great position. Uh, let's go to your eternal politics. You are Antigonus II, you have a son called Demetrius II, and then you have a nephew? No, this is a brother, Demetrius. Demetrius Kalos, 10 years old, and your son is 4 years old. Uh, so you may need to swap around who you wish to be your heir. Your wife or queen is Phila. Phila of Pella. <laughs> um, and you are a kingdom. Of course, you're a kingdom. A little bit tough with the public order issues that you have to deal with but you do get the plus one experience of rank for all of your units you recruit ever really really nice to have that especially in the early game where your units aren't really too elite you're not in the prime of your macedonian roster just yet so you may want to stick with this for a little while um, but if not you can be an oligarchy empire or a politia a city-state basically i recommend try and stay as a kingdom uh, unless the public order is really getting to you, but that plus one experience rank is a really nice thing to have in the early game. Uh, and then you of course have the Hellenic nobility, the Macedonian nobility, and the Thessalian nobility. So you've got a lot of people to keep happy straight away on turn one. You start off as uh, respected though, so that's pretty good. And your, um, what do you call it, influence in the Senate's pretty balanced. Not really too much else to talk about here. Uh, although your king is 29 years old, Antigonus Ganatus, uh, so you may wish to be a little bit more protective of him until your son gets of age to rule. Because 29 is actually quite old in the ancient world. Um, but that's essentially it for your politics. Now let's move on to your population. So as a one hit quitter, you're of course going to be restricted with your population. We go to your city of Pella, and we can see immediately you only have 35,000 fighting men available. Uh, here is the details of that. 
it is relatively well uh, spread out so that does help however your nobility class is of course going to be pretty restricted down to just 1500 um, but it's not too terrible however again you're a one-hit recruiter so you recruit a full army of, of a 2020 stack most of that population is going to be hit pretty hard or well, not most but a, you know a good third of it get yourself a second army and then your population is going to be really quite low so you're probably just going to want to recruit one single army and with that army though you are probably going to want to go ahead and conquer other Hellenic factions because they will give you massive source of manpower to command Larissa 30,000 Apollonia 25,000 Athens another 25 Sparta 20,000 and then out here in Crete they have 20,000 and then you also have more Greek factions to your eastern Anatolia such as Pergamon which starts off at 35,000 and generally the AI just increases their population I rarely see it go down uh, Ethosos 30,000 Rhodes 25 Pessinius 30,000 and then oh no I've got all of them there so you can get quite a lot of population at your disposal however in the long haul it is kind of limited until you begin expanding way out east into Seleucid territory and Egyptian territory because they're both Hellenic factions uh, and you'll get some areas that are Hellenic dominant although there is a lot of different cultures going on out there in the east uh, so it's not a, a surefire way of getting that increase you can always you know try to get into southern Italy uh, and Sicily which will both have some Greek culture but then you've got to take on the juggernaut of Rome and you don't really want to do that not until the late game where you're a little bit more prepared um, so population tricky start definitely restrictive uh, and you're really going to be aware of what unit is from what population if we go to your pikemen for example uh, your pikemen is at the politides social class which I believe is your tier 2 yes so you only have 4,500 potential pikemen recruits in your city that's going to be about what you're going to pour into a single uh, army of pikemen at least it's 256 men per pike uh, four units is going to take up a thousand of your population so you really aren't going to be able to spam these too heavily at least not from the tier 2 population now you do get access to other units as you expand of course and being in Macedon, you also have one of the best uh, AOR mercenary units available to you straight away. Um, you get more Macedonian mercenary pikes, although again, they're politized social class. But then from the Barbaro, you get Agrianian cell swords, an amazing unit. Very, very nice to have as a merc. Uh, and then do we get it as an AOR unit here? No, not yet. I believe you need to expand yes so we can get some Molossian, Molossian hounds as an AOR unit and then dart slingers which is nice um, but as you expand to the uh, west you'll get access to what do you call them Agrianian uh, Peltus and Axemen amazing units amazing 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 very very nice to have be aware of that um, just wanted to go through here and show you that you only have one line of barracks you don't have anything special going on with your barracks but you do have to wait for certain reforms to, tr to uh, trigger of course which we'll talk about in a little bit uh, but anyway that's it for your population overall it's definitely quite tricky but you do have some population available to you in surrounding cities and provinces just not to your north or northeast uh, as you go that way you're really gonna have to rely on foreign population Anyway, your economy. Well, your economy starts off extremely small. Pala is a nice city to have, but you got no trade coming in at all, and a lot of people don't really like you because you did conquer most of the known Greek world and beyond <laughs> into Persia. Um, but if you do want to go ahead and kind of be a little bit gamey, send out your fleet way out west to like, you know, all the way to Iberia, you get a, a lot of trade flowing in with a lot of tribes. That will give you a nice big boost to your income in the early game, especially if you can take these resources. The AI is a lot more willing to trade with you if you do have resources available uh, in your economy. Um, however, besides that, you also have the wonders of Greece and Anatolia, of course. 
obviously one there's one in Ephesus over here and then one in Rhodes um, and then one in Sparta as well so immediately you can get yourself some pretty juicy wonders that will help out your economy a lot you will probably want to adjust your buildings based on those wonders uh, for example you might get a boost from maritime commerce or from culture focus your buildings on really abusing that and use temples and whatever to back them up uh, you're not really going to be an ag a agricultural superpower it's not really your thing uh, you could maybe do that with the province of Thrace however you've got to be busy trying to deal with public order issues out here um, and it's also kind of your frontier you got the Danube right over here and you will have you know nomads coming in along the coast uh, the Dacians and whatnot trying to cross as well so you're probably not going to want to turn that into an agricultural power hub but you can if you like because having four cities in a single province is it's solid amount it is not too bad at all um, but anyway your economy is just it's going to take quite a while to get up there overall it's not terrible but it will take some time and you will need to really think about what you want to do with certain provinces such as Greece or Hellas anyway that's almost what I have to say about Mas uh, Macedon's campaign situation. Overall, it's not too terrible. It used to be really tough. It used to be like a solid 8 out of 10, like this is a tough campaign. But now that you have the client state of Athens, and you at least have the option of trying to like buy them out, uh, whereas before it was like almost guaranteed they would fight you, uh, turn 1, um, that really can help take the pressure off your south I do recommend you take out the Aetolians in Apollonia first off oh wait yeah we don't have any other diplomacy going on even with the Aetolians just want to double check um, you're probably going to want to go ahead and you know solidify your province straight away get that done within the first five to ten turns recruit yourself some pikemen and some good cavalry to go out and try and smash their forces easily which you should be able to um, Epirus has some nice troops, but they are also busy sending them over to Italy to fight Rome. So now's the perfect time to stab them in the back. Do it before Rome takes Apollonia. It will make your game so much easier if you can keep Rome out of Greece. It really is like such a critical thing to do. So take Apollonia, backstab the Epirus, and uh, you'll have more Hellenic troops and amazing AOR units over there to recruit from. So why wouldn't you? But anyway, speaking of what to do though, let's move on to the tips section of your campaign overview. Uh, number one thing, absolutely use your pikes heavily, heavily, heavily. Pikes are really, really amazing against the AI. Obviously, if you're doing a head-to-head -head campaign, that's an entirely different scenario. But against the AI, they will often charge head-on into your pikes with cavalry, with infantry, with everything. Um, they will target your pikes for skirmishes. So be aware of that. Uh, you can certainly, you know, lose with pikes, but in in general, using a pike-based army is really going to get you some seriously disgusting win uh, wins. Um, I would really try to rush your surrounding neighbors, like your uh, war against Popadeva up here. I would probably try to take them out um, very quickly. They do need a few turns to recruit an army, but I would probably do that first before you come on down and take Apollonia and uh, Larissa. I should have mentioned that before. I keep forgetting that you're in war with them now. I don't know why I keep forgetting, because it is obviously important. Um, also, be aware they can like travel down through here. Uh, and then up over that way, obviously, and down here. So they've got a few way ways of hitting you. You really just want to take it as quickly as you can. You might even just want to liberate it so you can use an ally over here to help you deal with the other Thracians while you're busy fighting off the Greeks. Um, moving on, recreating the Alexander Empire is really the actual smart thing for you to do because your military, while right now you're the small guy, your military is on par with the other Greek factions, if not almost superior to all of them. Um, you're really on the level of the Seleucids, uh, the Egyptians. You you actually have better troops than the Egyptians. They just have a lot more diversity than you, but you have more elite uh, Greek units. And the Seleucids are probably basically on par with you, I would argue. Pergamon is not too far behind you, but it is slightly behind. Um, and then like Athens, Sparta, 
uh, all of these like single city state sort of factions like Rhodes you know they'll all get demolished by you they don't really use pikes themselves all that much so your pike armies will just march on into Athens like it's nothing uh, Larissa is the same thing they use uh, hoplites primarily Epirus on the other hand does like to use a lot of pikemen but again they're getting thrashed by Rome they're not going to be too worried about defending against you uh, the barbarian factions to your north it's going to be the same sort of deal they don't have units that will counter your pikes all that well they'll have javelins and uh, you know fast moving light infantry but as long as you can you know box them in certain areas or navigate your army to a position where you know you're not going to be too outflanked or anything your army will annihilate theirs your army just massively outclasses the barbarian factions um, so if you can survive to the mid game you really are just going to start snowballing out of control even Rome Rome on a one-to-one -one basis they will lose against your armies because legion legionaries can't reach you when you have a Sarissa pointed at their face <laughs> Um, it, the Roman legionaries really struggle against your pikes, uh, which is historically accurate. You know, it took quite a little bit of maneuvering and whatnot to deal with Macedon for Rome. So now you can abuse that, uh, that historical knowledge as well as their gameplay mechanics. You can actually take on Rome. The thing about taking on Rome, though, is that they'll just have massive amounts of armies pouring out over towards you. So they'll get you with the numbers game, but. And a one-to-one -one basis, your armies will beat Rome. Um, that's just the way it is with these uh, Diadochi factions. Um, and just be aware that while you are, you know, even after you deal with Pope Endeavor and you start marching south and whatever, all of the barbarian factions really don't like you. So I would expect it to be a bit of a snowball thing where, like, say you take Pope Endeavor, then I would expect to get hit from the west or the east. Um, even then, once you take over these areas, you're probably going to get hit by the Gate coming in from the north. Um, the Scythians and other nomads do come down across the Danube, uh, and their horse-based archer armies will be very annoying to deal with. So um, you can deal with them, and again, they will charge into your pikes after they run out of ammo. But until then, protect your men as much as you can. Um, but anyway, that's pretty much it for tips. I think the campaign is a lot easier than what it used to be. It's still tricky in the early game. Uh, but it, that's kind of what I could say for almost every faction out there. At least every faction that's a one hit or quitter. Um, obviously, if you make the wrong move of Macedon, say you march at Pulp Endeavor and you just completely blunder your army and get wiped out, obviously you're going to have a tough campaign. Your Chances are you're going to get thrashed. If you ignore Pulp Endeavor and go ahead and attack Apollonia and Epirus beats you back or at least hurts your army really severely, obviously Pal is going to be, you know, left wide open. And then who knows what's going to happen. So, it can definitely be a very tricky start, but because your military is so freaking good, uh, and you still do have a, a decent population recruit pool, not amazing, but decent, considering you're Greek. Um, I think it's definitely improved a lot more than what it used to be uh, and you just have more options now uh, depending on the difficulty you play on but do keep in mind this is based on a normal campaign difficulty rating but anyway ladies and gentlemen that's it for the campaign section of this video let's go ahead and talk about the military of Macedon Alrighty everyone, here we are at the part 2 section of this video where we're going to check out the military of the Macedonian Kingdom, the Macedonian Empire, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, this is going to be a very large section as the Macedonians have a lot of units and a lot to talk about with them. I will try to skim over some of the lesser units where I can for the sake of saving time. Uh, that and you guys don't need to be given every single little tiny detail. Uh, you know, I don't want to spoil everything for you guys. Oh, hello. Hey, you going, mate? We've got some viewers in the background over here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, before we do jump into our land unit, so let's talk quickly about reforms and then about your navy. So first off, your reforms are, of course, the Thurios and Thorax reforms. You have the Thurios reforms for yourself at turn 50 at Imperium level 3. And then you have 
The four extra forms at turn 120 at Imperium level five. Once you once you achieve all of those, then you'll be able to get all of your units. Uh, the reforms are very important for you, by the way. You'll still get access to some really nice units before it, but once you hit the four extra forms, you are really got to be using some seriously elite units. Um, and so let's talk briefly about your navy. I'm not going to bother showing you guys. Um, but you do have several ships, however, it's mostly just marines. The marines themselves are pretty good. Um, you do have two archers that you can choose, but they're only in smaller ships. And then you do get access to one ballista ship, so that's helpful. Uh, the main thing to know about your navy is that while it's mainly marine based, you do have the Hepteras Super Juggernaut ship. Uh, the, at least the ship that I absolutely love has 2,000 hit points and it has 180 marines on it. So massive ship, really, really, uh, really, really helpful for your fleets, especially when you take on your fellow Greeks because they all have really good navies. Um, but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump into your land forces. Uh, before we do, though, I do just want to mention that there is a few AOR and I believe also mercenary units you can recruit in the custom battle screen or I think it's just AOR actually I have not selected them for this uh, overview just because I'm really trying to focus only on the core rosters of all of these factions and then of course I tell you guys about what AOR mercs you can get uh, usually after um, uh, usually sorry when we're in the campaign or at the end of the land units section that's typically when I'll talk about it. Perhaps I'll try to make it a little bit more official. But I do want to just say right here, right now, I have intentionally left out the AOR units. I'll say it again because I know I'm going to get at least one comment about this. I have intentionally left out the AOR units of Macedon. And I've done that because, I mean, I'm telling you guys because the units are amazing. And so I'm sure there'll be some people who will be like, hey, what about this unit? Yes, I know it's part of the Macedonian roster, kind of. It's not a part of their core roster, it's just an, a unit that they basically get from turn one anyway. So I will mention them now. Um, there is the Agrianian Cell Swords and Agrianian Peltus, amazing units that you get pretty much access to on turn one. Uh, Rhodian Slingers, same sort of deal there. Everyone knows Rhodian Slingers. Amazing uh, Slingers for sure. And then Cretan Archers. Cretans being fantastic, very, very high damaging, very useful for you because you do need skirmishes that do high damage. Just want to give all of those a special shout out. But anyway, let's go ahead and check Come out your on. army. You can see we got a lot to talk about here, as I said earlier. Companion Cavalry! Companion Cavalry, you have your late sacred squadron right here. This is our general, one out of three different general's bodyguards you can get access to. This is the elitist, uh, elitist. <laughs> this is the best unit that you can get, uh, which is obviously a cavalry unit. It is very rare because it has 200 men in its cavalry unit. However, don't think that it makes it invincible. And in fact, often the units that do have more men in them actually end up dying a little bit faster. Um, just, it kind of depends on like the hit points assigned to that specific unit and the armor and whatnot. But this is still an amazing unit. They have very good armor, so they are going to last a long time. Uh, fantastic. One of the best melee cav units in the game. Melee attack of 13, straight off the bat, defense of 14, charge of 40, weapon damage total of 35. Um, they even have a bonus versus infantry of 4. Just fantastic all around. Um, they can fire while they're moving because they do have an ammunition of 6 as well. And we're going to be seeing that as a pattern and just, oh my goodness, don't they look amazing? <laughs> Obviously it gives us some very big Alexander the Great vibes. And you can get him leading these in your Macedonian, uh, I mean Alexander campaign. But anyway, we're going to jump to your skirmishes. Then after that will be your swords. And after that will be uh, all kinds of spears and cavalry after that. So again, time steps will be down below because this is going to be a long section. Missile. Anyway, you can see the unit cards of your skirmishes are highlighted there at the bottom of the screen. 
We have a Greek javelin unit right here, terrible low level unit, but I just thought I'd uh, at least show you guys that it's there anyway. We then have your Ifcratian uh, early Peltus. A Peltus unit, but they also have spear. Uh, the melee defense is really good at 16 and attack is okay at 8. Uh, so these are the types of units that you will want supporting your cavalry on the flanks and then charge into enemy cavalry in melee. Very, very nice unit overall. Definitely Peltists! a must have. Then you have just some mid tier Peltus right here as well. Bloody hell, that sun's bright. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, really, really nice, especially because of their armor. It's at 25. Ammunition is just at 6, but their defense of 14 and attack of 9 will still make them be very useful as like a flanking force. Uh, 175 men in this. Same figure or last Peltus we just checked out, too. But that's all of your Peltus. You do have access to three of them instantly as part of your core roster. And again, the Agrianians, which are AOR units. Um, and a Merc unit, I believe. So, just a FYI. That's what you got going on there. Slingers! We then jump up to some Dart Slingers. Uh, interesting unit. I didn't even realize this was a part of the Macedonian core roster, but everyone I've talked to was like, yeah, man, it's always been a thing. <laughs> so I didn't even realize this. Uh, I don't play Macedon all that much, to be honest. Uh, interesting unit, the Dart Slingers. They're really good against the AI, against players in online battles. I'm not so sure. Uh, speaking from experience, which you guys will see very soon in online battles, if you haven't already seen it already in the past. Uh, interesting unit. The Dart Slingers really need their own sort of special spotlight video, so I'm hoping to do one of those very soon. But just want to let you know you do get access to them. Uh, also as an AOR unit. You do have them available in your core starting province. Archers! You then have a single Greek archer, terrible archer unit. Avoid it if you can. Slingers! And then you have a terrible Greek slinger unit. But its range is at 190, which is standard for like mid-tier slingers, so... Uh, that's helpful. Your archer's range is only 165. You know, very levy focused units. Try to avoid them if you can. But yet again, you do have the Cretan archers, which are amazing. Uh, and just fantastic. So that's your skirmishes. Um, fairly well balanced, but you obviously have a uh, tendency to go for short range skirmishing with your Peltus, which is very helpful because it will help your cavalry win the flanks even more. And that's really where Macedon shines. Melee infantry ready. However, now you can see we have group two selected here. These are your melee units, at least your sword melee units, not your spears and pikes and all that. We have your Greek infantry levy unit right here. Uh, nothing too special about them at all. Very terrible stats pretty much across the board. However, they do have an ammunition of three. So 300 men throwing three javelins. Uh, that's 900 javelins that get thrown by this unit, assuming they all don't die. Um, so there you go can be helpful in that regard and they for whatever reason do have skirmish mode interesting Warriors of Macedon. I did Ready not notice that before they will bleed oh. for our swords. as does your next unit your Thurio swordsman I guess they kind of act as skirmishes in a way um, Thurio swords ah oh man I, I really I'm getting conflicted using Thurio's units lately guys I'm seeing them do amazing in some battles mainly the spearmen though and then the Thurio swordsman usually not as well. Uh, their armor is also only at 8, so it's a really low armor, but they do have 3 javelins, defense of 14, attack of 9. Um, total weapon damage is only at 26, so I honestly don't really like using the swords all that much. They're kind of a good reserve unit to have in my opinion, or they can be a good front line to sort of um, drain the uh, stamina and whatnot of the enemy. The you then have an interesting unit here, which is basically like another Thurios uh, unit, your White Shield Infantry. Very similar story to the Thurios Swords, except they have an armor of 10, but they also have armor piercing damage. I think they use a Seeker, uh, Seeker, however you want to call it. They're kind of like the Seeker Bearers that could take it. Ah, oh, we can't see their melee unit, uh, melee weapon, sorry. We do have a single Javelin to throw here, not three. Um, but they have a bonus versus elephants of 34. That's insane, man. Ridiculous. And they only have a bonus versus cav of 5. Um, 
But they do have armor pen as well, armor penetration of 7, so a total of 28 weapon damage, melee attack of 9, defense of 9. These guys could be good to swarm elephants, basically. Get them fighting elephants and they will do wonders for you. Uh, you might want to use them when you're facing Epirus in particular in the early game. Ready. We then have the Thorax Reforms, where you get the Thorax Swordsman. Uh, these guys are definitely worth recruiting, just be aware that they are only 200 men per unit and usually once you get to the Thorax Reforms, you'll have like the Juggernaut faction such as Rome with their very good heavy infantry as well. So while your unit right here isn't bad, uh, it's nothing special in the world of uh, heavy infantry, basically. It's just a typical heavy infantry unit. You definitely will want to use it, but yeah, the Romans will definitely just give you a run for your money uh, and it's you know most of the Greek factions get access to a unit like that royal peltasts however we then have the royal peltas these boys they are bad bad boys they have a melee attack of a whopping 16 that's insane for a swordsman melee defense of 8 so it's not amazing but still pretty good Melee defense of 8, uh, so not amazing, but still pretty good. Um, total weapon damage of 29, however, they have an armor of 30. And they do have two javelins to throw before they get into combat, and they have the discipline buff. Um, I don't know why they call the Peltas. They only have two javelins. I'm not really f completely familiar with the term Peltas, so perhaps someone else can tell me in the comments. Order. Uh, I do appreciate you guys giving info in the comments. Uh, it's always very much appreciated, so feel free to throw it down below. But these are your royal pelters, but don't be fooled, they only have two javelins. They're not an actual proper pelters that you might expect has like a bunch of javelins. But anyway, that is your swordsman. Uh, you'll notice that you're really lacking a solid mid-tier core sword unit. And that's because your army isn't really sword core focused. Yes, you can have access to swords, but these are mostly flanking units that will get you um, some good kills, depending on what it is. Like your Royal Peltas, you're not going to have a whole army of them. They're going to be on the flanks doing some really heavy damage. What will be in your core, though, is your spears. Oh my goodness, do we have a lot of spears to talk about. Look at all this. It's in Holy bloody hell! The blue line almost took us out, guys. Fire out. <laughs> uh, where is it here? Orders! Um, so I divided up your spear group into two spear groups. That's how many spears we have, as you can see. Uh, we're going to talk about your hoplites and then your spearmen, and then we're going to talk about your pikemen. And then even in your pikemen, you have two different types of pikemen as well. So, <laughs> so let's get to work very quickly on your spearmen. Light you have Macedonian light hoplites. Uh, I have many times in the past said I don't like light hoplites. I feel like they don't have much of a purpose, and then... Many of you guys have pointed out, well, at least not many, but some of you guys have pointed out that they can be very helpful to support your cavalry, especially in the early game. I can see that, absolutely, um, but I would rather rely on something like a Thurio Spear, which is far more cost effective. And it has 300 men, and it has a javelin compared to your Macedonian Light Hotplots. Obviously, you need to wait until you get to the Thurio's reforms to get them. So, I mean, in the first, like, you know. A uh, couple dozen turns or so, these guys can be helpful, but wouldn't really recruit them too much. Alicia! They don't have a phalanx ability either, FYI. However, your levy hoplites do, um, but they are just a levy hoplite, so stats across the board are really low. Armor is only at 15. Same thing for your Macedonian light hoplites, so, so you might actually want to recruit the light hoplites over your levy hoplites. Levies are really like a last resort anyway. Um, uh, something else to point out about your light hoplites is the morale isn't that bad at 43 and they have a bonus versus cav and elephants of 18 uh, which is very respectable they're useful I'll admit it guys I'll admit it they're useful but I just I, I personally wouldn't really recruit them I would rather focus on other sorts of spears Hoplites! and right here this is going to be your core army potentially if you don't want to use pikemen. Um, just very solid mid-tier uh, hoplites right here. With an armor of 30, which is really substantial. You can get them turn one, so, you know, that's really serious. Attack of seven, which is kind of low, but then they have defense of 15. 
Uh, total weapon damage of 26, which is a little low, but it's, it's okay. Uh, both base round of 43. And then they have bonus versus elephants and cavalry of 17, and they have the discipline buff. Um, so, should they get into some trouble and get surrounded, they'll actually still do quite well. Shield bearers! We then jump all the way up to your shield bearers. Um, basically, your elite hoplites. Very, very badass looking. Um, they can be very helpful in online battles, actually. I've seen them do some insane amounts of kills. Uh, they will outclass like Spartans, for example, at least the typical solid core Spartan hoplite, but obviously they'll get beaten down by the elites. But these guys are fantastic. Stats across the board, really, really impressive. Uh, armor 41 is really noteworthy and substantial. Melee defense of 19 and attack of 9. Like, it's disgusting. <laughs> it's really, really serious hoplites. Um, but that's... Straight off the bat, you get access to four hoplites. Then we'll move on to your spearmen. Throw your spears! Throw your spears! You have throw your spears, obviously. Um, fantastic unit, absolutely cost effective. You want at least two of these in all of your armies ever created as Macedon. It's just that good. Obviously, though, you do have to wait for the Thurios reforms. Spearman, at the ready. Same thing for the Thorax spears. Uh, although I'm not so sure that they're as cost effective as ethereal spears, but they're still very very helpful Really fantastic stats and really nice abilities too. They have defensive formation and hollow square Ethereal spears don't have either of those But you have a big downgrade uh, going from 300 ethereal spears to just 200 for X spearmen Yeah, but yeah, man just you your stats as the Thorax are just insane. Armor 38, defense of 20. 20 defense, what is that? That's redonkulous. Imagine putting that into like a defensive formation. Good luck trying to break them. Um, and this spear is even slightly longer than the Thurio spears, which does make a difference. FYI, you can see you know, a little bit of a comparison here. Um, so do note that. But amazing spears, even though you only have just two Kind of more loose spears as opposed to hoplites. Pikes at the ready. However, we then have the pikes at the ready. That's right, we've got four different pikemen to talk about. You have your Greek bronze shield pikemen available to you on turn one, I believe. Um, not an amazing pike unit, but it is a pike unit. Uh, and because of that, you're really going to be just using these guys a lot. Uh, you know, the pike is just so powerful in DEI. Uh, that combined with, you know, the stats overall are very solid. An armor of 35 is really, really nice for a pike unit. Because the way pikemen are usually defeated is by bombarding them with skirmishes. That or uh, surrounding them. So that armor is really going to help them survive against uh, all of those javelins and whatever being thrown at them. But yeah, these guys are very badass. We then jump up to your Forex Bronze Shield Pikes. Um, similar sort of story to the last unit we just talked about. They do have the pike uh, phalanx formation, of course. Um, just stats pretty much across the board are just better. Um, slightly in every way. Nothing too crazy, so you can still get away with not recruiting them. Um, and they both even have the discipline buff, so yeah. I, I mean, the Greek bronze shield pikes are really nice, but Thorax... Just a slightly better version, uh, basically. It's not as much of a difference as, say, like the Furio Spears compared to the Thorax. The Thorax reform, I mean, the Thorax Spearmen have really significant stats. Um, so it's probably worth at least trying to use them in certain situations. Thorax Pike compared to the Furio Spears. Uh, but then we jump up to your Short Pikes. Now, your Short Pikes, you would think that because your Pike is shorter than the standard Sarissa, understand it's Sarissa, uh, they would be less effective, but ladies and gentlemen, do not worry, size does not matter. Um, these guys still have amazing stats, and these guys are kind of a little bit more akin to being like a shock sort of pike unit, because they're going to be getting you some serious kills. They've got a really high melee attack at 15, uh, compared to the Florex Bronze Shields at 11. So that's four difference, doesn't sound like a lot, but it has a really big impact. Melee defense of 10, armor of 30, very respectable. Weapon damage of 30. Charge bonus of 24 as well, compared to 21 of the Thorax. Um, 
these guys have a decent speed, they've got everything decent, and they do have the short pike phalanx ability. Um, which will increase their defense as well as their attack. So your melee attack starts off at 15 and it gets increased as soon as you hit that uh, ability. Woo! Yep, I, I get excited when they do do that, just FYI. Um, but yeah, just a really, really nice sort of mobile version of the pike. Uh, it depends on what sort of armies you're going up against. Uh, you may want to use the Sarissa pike against like slower uh, more Greek based armies whereas these shorter pikes will do really well against barbarians because they can adjust and get their formation ready a lot faster or uh, well, not a lot faster but relatively faster um, let's compare the speeds yeah Thrax bronze shields significantly slower as well very noteworthy that is I know words are good I'm good at words oh wow the texture of the ground blue Never mind. We'll just ignore that. Um, we have your elite guard right here. Another short pike unit. Same sort of deal. Short pike phalanx ability. Available to you at turn one. Stats across the board are pretty much better. Uh, the only thing to note though is that their attack is the exact same. But, I mean, their armor is quite substantially higher at 38 instead of just 30. Uh, defense is at 12. They are slower though, so... That might be a bit of a deal breaker for you, depending what you're trying to do with them. Um, but still, very, very useful unit. The short pikes are absolutely not to be trifled with. If you get them into a frontal engagement, especially like a grindy sort of fight against the enemy, they will get some serious kills. Um, absolutely not to be underestimated. But anyway, that is your... Uh, that's your uh, pikes right there, that I just selected with the unit cards, Finisher! and then number three is your spears and hoplites. Obviously your army is absolutely tailored towards spearmen. Um, you will definitely want to use and abuse that. It's kind of unfortunate though, because pikes ready. this whole group of hoplites, well I, sh I, I shouldn't say the whole group, your hoplites over here, or four units, they could be kind of just counted out. You could delete these and you would still have an amazing roster because you got all of these awesome pikes and then you got the awesome spears right here to support after you hit your reforms. Um, your hoplites, they're going to be more of like an early game sort of deal. Maybe a roleplay thing depending on what you want to do. Uh, but yeah, your hoplites, after you hit that first reform, you're not really going to need them anymore at all. Fire out, what is going on with this? arrows and lines today sorry guys our production is out the window today oh my god anyway let's move on to your cavalry you got two big lines right here I have basically combined your melee cavalry units into this um, specifically two of them into your uh, skirmisher cat because you're gonna see a pattern of javelins being ready for everybody but anyway let's start at the bottom down here your lowest tier unit you have Greek javelin cavalry 120 men and they are very fast with an 8 speed but their armor is at 4 um, you really don't want them to get stuck in a melee engagement but their ammunition is only at 6 too so a bit of a shame ready. on that part uh, they'll be good for scouting though and chasing down enemy skirmishers you then have medium skirmisher cavalry right here armor of 18 so it's a bit of an increase uh, ammunition still just at 6 though 6 javelins isn't terrible um, uh, but it, you can definitely see a pattern of your cavalry will have like four to six javelins to throw, but then the units like this are going to be quite good at melee engagements. The only issue with this unit in particular is that it's lacking armor, but it's got an attack of 11 and a defense of 10, very, very respectable. Um, just that armor is kind of low, but they do have 120 men in their units, so... You might want to use these guys to chase down enemy like cavalry. We then have your Furios Cavalry. Armor again, and most of your stats are getting increased. Just the only thing that's going down that's noteworthy is your attack, which is only at 9. Fence is at 10 though, so not too terrible. Weapon damage total of 33. That's very high. Armor of 23. Um, and then again, only 6 javelins. So same sort of deal, 120 men. These guys can do okay in a melee engagement, especially against the light cav. Um, just be aware that their armor is kind of low. To However, 
would then have a massive jump up to your Royal Squadron. Uh, these guys have a whopping 38 armor, insane. Melee attack of 13, insane. And a melee defense of 14. You guessed it, it's insane. Very, very, very nice stuff going on. Total weapon damage of 35. They even got a good charge bonus of 40. Uh, bloody insane. Ammunition of 6 again. These guys, they are going to be slower than your other cav, but man, they can be some tanky boys here. They're going to really cut through some seriously heavy uh, cavalry. These guys are the type of units you want to use against like enemy cataphracts once you have them stopped and stuck, you know? They will cut them down really, really well. Uh, you should note though that you only have 100 men in that unit. Tarantine cavalry! We then have your Tarantine Cavalry. I know. What a shocker. Um, this is technically your melee cav unit. However, I put it here with your skirmishers because, again, we still have a lot of javelins. you got four javelins to throw, uh, which is quite a fair few. You've got also 120 men here again. High speed of 8 yet again. And an armor 28, which is really nice considering your speed. Overall, really, really fantastic unit to have, especially in like online battles. You'll see these guys use quite a lot. They're good for scouting, they're good for melee engagements, uh, they're good for a lot of stuff. They're just not going to get a lot of kills on the charge, but they can still be helpful charging in. Uh, they can kind of do everything. They're not amazing at anything in particular, but I can absolutely give a good Macedonia. go at everything. We then have your Macedonian Citizen Cavalry. They don't have any ammunition, I just put it here because Yagi Tarantine's here. Um, these are really your only two dedicated melee cav units, um, at least kind of more so dedicated, with this one being your purely dedicated. <sighs> Technicalities, doesn't matter guys. Either way, just want to let you know that you have them, nothing special there at all, but you know, just a solid mid-tier cav unit for you. Cavalry! Then we move on to your shock cav, let me highlight cavalry. them for you, so you can see them. There's, down here is the uh, unit cards, where it's a little bit darkened in the background. Sarissa Lancers. Uh, 120 men, horrible defense of only 4, but their melee attack is a whopping 12, charge bonus a whopping 63. Whew. And they're very fast with a good speed of 8. These guys are amazing. They also have the Thessalian horse, which is uh, very, very nice. Larger and faster than average mounts, apparently. I need to do more studying on to figure out the, all the different breeds of horses in DEI. Uh, I'd love to do a video talking about that for you guys, but basically... Really, really nice cav unit. Ready to ride. And next to their buddies, the Vassalian Cavalry, uh, who should also have the Vassalian Horse, yes they do. Um, they're, I'm just trying to notice, looks like their spears are actually longer for the um, Sarissas. The Vassalian Cavalry though do have the Diamond Formation. And the Diamond Formation oh, diamond absolutely formation. does make a difference. You'll see them used quite a lot also oh, in... Um, online battles. Uh, that's absolutely intentional. People know that they can be very helpful, so try to use that when you can. I would recommend it. Stats are really nice overall, and you still have an armor 28, whereas your Sarissa Lancers only have 11. But your defense is still horrible at 5, and you only have 100 men, as opposed to 120 for your Sarissas. The brave, ready for orders. We then have your Royal Squadron, still just a purely dedicated shot cave unit as evidenced by their horrible melee defense of just 5. But man, their stats are very very nice still. They don't have the diamond formation unfortunately, but they've got an armor of 38. So they can take some, uh, you know, skirmishing damage. Uh, you don't want them to, because they don't really have a shield at all. Uh, but their armor should protect them when they actually do get hit. Uh, so, Companion cavalry. that's your royal squadron. Ready to ride. We then have your sacred squadron, which is basically uh, very similar to your general, except your general goes more into the melee cavalry uh, variety and skirmish cav at the same time because it's got six javelins. Whereas here, your sacred squadron unit is purely just a shock cav unit. But it's really, really good. Armor 41, which is friggin' insane. Uh, no javelins, but. Charge bonus 60, melee attack of 15, uh, total weapon damage, uh, where is it, it's here, uh, 33, 
their melee defense is only at 6 though, so again, do not let them get stuck in melee combat. That goes for all of your shock cavalry units. Don't let them get stuck in melee combat. You're going to have problems if you do. Anyway, moving on. Companion cavalry. You then have your late sacred squadron units. Um, this is different to your uh, general, by the way. Um, you can see a little bit of a comparison with statistics right here. Uh, in fact, I'll bring this uh, general over. Obviously, your general has 200 men in it, first off. Um, but then, cavalry. this late sacred squadron unit that isn't your general, it's more of a melee cavalry unit. And to be honest, I probably should have put it over here with the other um, Tarantines and, what do you call it, Macedonian citizen cav. Uh, they don't even have a javelin to throw as well, whereas your general has six, so that's why even though they have the exact same name, some people might be a little bit confused as to what's going on with them. Um, they very, very good, but I would argue your general is ten times better, purely because of your uh, numbers, javelins, all of that. Um, and just stats overall are really nice, but your late sacred squadron right here does have higher stats. Like a charge bonus of 53, despite having a melee defense and attack of 14. That's insane. So they're going to do really well on the charge, but then in a grind out fight, they'll still do amazing. Um, and this is why they do so well in the charge. They got that lance right there. So a fantastic unit to have for sure. Um, but just wanted to give you that comparison between that unit and your general. However, ladies and gentlemen, finally, that is it for your military. Very few negatives that can be talked about with it. You just, you really do cover pretty much absolutely everything. Uh, you, your main thing that you're lacking is armor penetration, but then you get access to armor penning units on turn one uh, via the Agrianians. And then as you expand into like Thrace and whatnot, you'll still have amazing, uh, what do you call it, armor penetration units to recruit into your army anyway. So besides that, uh, your army is just absolutely one of the best in the game. It's really good for online battles, too. Uh, just be aware, though, that taking on players with pikes is a lot more difficult than fighting the AI. But anyway, everybody, that's it for your military overview for Macedon. Overall, it's a fantastic military, and it will absolutely give you the opportunity to recreate Alexander's empire. Now let's go ahead and jump on into the verdict of this video. Alrighty everyone, here we are at the verdict section of this faction overview for Macedon. This is going to be a pretty quick verdict, even though it's been a long overview, uh, just because the military is so bloody big. But anyway, let's jump into our first point before we get to the difficulty rating that will come after this FYI. Um, in my opinion, overall the campaign is much easier than it was before. Um, Athens as a client state does help, although they will try to rebel against you at some point, depending on your difficulty you're playing on. But if you're playing on normal, which is what this campaign overview assumes you're doing, uh, generally it's okay and you can handle it. Some of the Greeks are less likely to declare war on you immediately. You still will feel it pretty overwhelmed. Um, Epirus, the Aetolians, and then you have barbarians to your north and east will be trying to attack you within the first few turns however it's the AI attacking you and you can use pike armies like I, I don't know what to say um, I can absolutely see how like maybe if you do a blunder with your army and you lose it or you lose a lot of men then you're kind of out of the campaign but just compared to before at least this is a much more typical DEI experience where you're not absolutely struggling you know uh, most factions in the early game it is tricky for them and if you do m mess up by losing an army or two, you are going to lose a campaign. That's the reality for like probably 75% of the factions in DEI, if not more than that. Macedon is no different. However, Macedon does have an amazing military. Uh, that's why Alexander did so well. It wasn't just because, you know, he is a charismatic leader. He had the best military of the entire world at his fingertips at that time, as well as being charismatic and all of those other things. To add to that point though, just be aware of the limitations of your units. Just because your pikemen get you, you know, a few hundred kills every battle doesn't necessarily mean that they're always going to do well. 
For instance, once you start doing sieges, your pikemen can be handy, but they are also going to struggle if you like just send them to attack on the walls. So, y y you know, obviously your army requires a fair bit of common sense. Your pikemen need to be in their pike formation on nice flat ground where it's uninterrupted and you can keep your army in a one massive giant blob, essentially. Uh, so, obviously be aware of what your army is best at and tailor your experiences to that. Fighting the Parthians and like the eastern major factions will be a little bit tricky for you because their cavalry will skirmish away at your heavy infantry, but then you have some of the best cavalry in the game as well. So, you know, you should be able to counter that just by chasing them down with your really fast uh, light skirmisher cav and whatnot. Uh, and then, again, AOR units will help you out massively. Your Rhodian Slingers can demolish Parthian archers. All of that sort of stuff can help you out insanely. And then we get to our final point, which is you will beat Rome if you abuse your pikes and your cav. Uh, Rome is often like one of the biggest sort of factions you got to deal with either in the mid or late game of your campaign uh, but it almost always survives throughout the entire campaign unless you the player take on Rome. Thankfully while you're playing as Macedon and other similar Diadochi successor whatever you want to call them factions uh, you have pikes and pikes will be legionaries hands down almost every single time depending on your environment and context of course but frontal engagements a pike is going to win almost every single time. So, you know, don't be afraid to take on Rome. Just be aware that Rome will spam a lot of armies at you because that's what Rome does. So try to, you know, keep them out of Greece until you are ready. Make sure you take over Apollonia as quickly as possible. But anyway, let's go ahead and finish this up by talking about the difficulty rating. Now, in the past, I could have seen this being, you know, pretty solid 8 out of 10, very hard campaign, surrounded by everyone, everyone hates you, all this blah 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 blah. However, in my opinion, I really think Macedon has been buffed quite a lot. And at least in the grand campaign, I think this is coming in at a very cheeky 5 out of 10. This is a normal difficulty campaign, in my opinion. Keep in mind, it is very normal for you to have a very tumultuous position in the early game in DEI for most factions. Any barbarian faction, they all start off with one city. Uh, you know, it's a very similar story for some of the Greek factions like Athens, Sparta, Pergamon, uh, Pontus. Uh, you do have obviously the few major players like the Seleucids and the Egyptians who have a lot of cities and whatnot. But your military is arguably better than theirs. It's at least better than Egypt's. Egypt's are nowhere near as elite as your units. They're still fantastic. Very, very powerful faction. But you taking on the AI, you should be able to outclass them relatively well. Uh, I won't say relatively easily, but, you know, it, it's very doable to do very well with Macedon. Um, you just have a very tricky start. But in my opinion... Because your military is still so powerful from turn one, you should still be winning most of those fights. Um, even if Athens revolts against you in turn one, you're fighting Sparta and Athens at the same time, your army should demolish them. They don't use pikes, at least not until the late game. Uh, they might try to get recruit mercenaries or whatever, but the core armies of the Greek city-states is just hoplites. Uh, yeah, the hoplites are absolutely, you know, tough, but your pikemen should demolish them. So, anyway, I'm sure that's going to be a very controversial difficulty rating. I know a lot of people have struggled with Macedon in the past. Um, if you've played Macedon a long time ago, before the 1.3 updates came out, I would definitely recommend you revisit Macedon and see if it's still as tough, or as it used to be at least. Um, but in my opinion, the military is just so good. Uh, you're surrounded by the best AOR mercenary units in the entire DEI game. You know, you have all of the tools needed to do well. You just need to, you know, think about who you're going up against and do really well in your battles, which isn't hard to do. Uh, especially against the AI. I should really note that. In a head-to-head -head campaign, sure, it's a whole other story. It's very tricky and all that. Um, but against the AI, your pikes should annihilate their armies. Anyway, everybody, I would really love to see what you think of all of that down below. And of course, do comment what faction you would like to see overviewed next. 
But until then, everybody, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I shall see you in the next one.